Hello and welcome to Optic West webinar, Creative Camera Techniques for Wildlife Photography with Christy Odom. Hi everyone, I'm David Brommer. I'm your MC at Optic West. We are so looking forward to having an amazing show for you guys. And we are very pleased for Nikon today to be bringing Nikon Ambassador Christy Odom here for the webinar. And Christy will also be speaking on day two of Optic West. Now you definitely wanna stay around for that day two of Optic West. That's gonna be on November 7th because Christy's gonna be giving away a Nikon Z6 Mark II kit during her presentation. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, now, Christy is a, an incredible uh, workshop instructor, an incredible photographer, uh, Nikon ambassador. She really knows her stuff. Uh, she's been doing recently some work on behalf of Nikon uh, for B&H Photos. She's been traveling around the world. She leads workshops around the world. And right now, they're actually doing uh, their workshop 2024 season, some pre-bookings. She's going to flash her website at the end of this. You'll want to jump over to that website and take a look at her upcoming workshops. Also joining us today is Paul Van Allen, Nikon Professional Services, otherwise known as NPS Rep. And uh, I hate to say this, but I think I've known Paul for around 30 years. Uh, he's also going to be in Monterey, California. And, you know, we're very happy that everyone is joining us virtually today. You also have the option for Optic to watch the live, uh, the live, the main stage and the Explorer stage will be streamed from the B&H website. But what we really want to do is we want to meet our West Coast customers. So if you can, make sure you definitely stop by Optic West on November 6th and 7th and partake of all the goodness that we are bringing to Monterey, California, and the home of the F-64 photography movement. So without further ado, I want to introduce Christy. Christy, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> well, you know, you were originally scheduled for Optic West that was taking place in San Francisco in March of 2020. <laughs> exactly. But now it's finally happening, and I couldn't be more just jazzed. <laughs> and and we brought it to an amazing place in Monterey this time. <laughs> so this is great. Uh, so you know, let's talk about uh, Q&A uh, today. Um, everybody is welcome to drop their Q and their questions into the YouTube chat. We're also joined by Paul Van Allen, who really knows so much about uh, the technology. Hey, Paul, there he is. And uh, Paul will be able to answer those questions in the YouTube. Uh, but questions really directly to Christy, drop it into the YouTube. And at the end of the presentation, we'll be asking select questions from the YouTube to Christy. And how you doing, Paul? You're, you're muted, my friend. There you go. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. So so good to see you. I, I hope people get to uh, come over and check out the, the macro setup you're going to be demonstrating at Optic. You're always like, bring it. I used to come to the B&H event space with, with tubs of water, fish tanks, all sorts of really cool stuff. So it's great to have you on board. Okay. Um, you ready to go, Christy? I'm ready. I'm really excited because I get to share lots of new work today. So I can't wait to talk about some of my new projects. <laughs> awesome. Well, you got 675 people watching right now. I'm sure that's going to go over a thousand. So break a leg. We're going to we're going to tear it off and uh, give it all to you. Thank you so much. Everyone give a warm welcome to Christy Odom. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate every single one of you. And I'm really excited to share some of my work. All right. So. I'm Christy Odom. I'm a conservation photographer and a visual artist based in Longmont, Colorado. I'm part of the Nikon Ambassador team. I'm also an associate fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers. For me, my passion drives my photography. And what am I most passionate about? I'm most passionate about wildlife and the nature and the world we live in. So to me, photography is a way to connect deeper to wildlife and discover and explore more about behavior, more about the different biodiversity that's around. It's a celebration of what I love. And today I'm going to talk and start talking about one of my favorite things to photograph. We're going to jump right in and talk about bears. <laughs> bears are one of my favorite subjects because as a photographer, one of the things I'm trying to do is I'm trying to connect people emotionally to wildlife. I want to show that animals have their own character and personalities and their own emotions with the hopes that my work can connect other people and share my passion and get more people to respect and love our planet and hopefully take care of it a bit more. 
Before we get into some advanced creative techniques, I want to talk about how every single setting in a way is its own creative technique. So we're going to go from the very basics because everything we do from our aperture choice to our shutter choice to our lens choice is a creative decision to give our own unique perspective and our, show our own voice of what we are experiencing with photography. I just got back from leading a workshop in Alaska and this was my first time at this specific area and I did a ton of research on on what lenses I needed to bring and you know what equipment I needed to bring up there and um, everyone's telling me like you know the bears are really close 70 to 200s the, the longest lens you'll need is a 1 to 400 and I kept hearing that over and over again and I kept thinking well you know what the 500 the Nikon 500 f mount lens even with my mirrorless camera is like one of my favorite lenses it's a lens that i love and to be honest like i really like the tight shots and sure enough the bears they were really close to the point where i couldn't get the full bodies um but at the same time like for me having that lens because it is one of my favorites I'm able to really like get tight into that action. I wanted that tight shot that showed the expression of the bear fishing and showed the fish. And so I did use a longer lens and I kind of ignored all this advice because everything that we're doing in photography is an artistic decision. Um, everything from my angle, I got as low as possible. I think I was lying on fish guts in order to get this shot. So I got low to the ground because when you have water or anything, you want to be able to separate that from the background. So having a dark background behind water splashes or rain will help it pop or snow. So I wanted that really low angle and yeah, I got kind of smelly to get this shot. But I also wanted a minimum depth of field. I'm constantly shooting at my shallowest depth of field because I want just a little bit in focus. I want to really celebrate the subject and, and hide the distracting elements that might be in the background. I did shoot this at um, f7.1 because I wanted just a little bit more depth of field because I had two subjects here with the fish and the bear. And so everything here from the fast shutter speed to get all those water droplets, the low angle, the lens choice was a creative artistic decision. Even our exposure can be a creative artistic decision. I was out leading a workshop at Lake Clark in Alaska and it was there were a lot of workshop groups out there. <laughs> and there were these bears and in the water, the tide was low and they were fighting in this low tide and it was like water was splashing and it was beautiful. And there were these, we went out into the water and the bears were fighting with this gold light on them. It was beautiful. The light was over our shoulder, hitting the subjects. And there were so many photographers taking these photos that it was like this orchestra of shutter drives <laughs> and surround sound all over. And, and the bears were fighting, 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 beautiful light. And then the bears ran from this side to the other side of us. And all of a sudden the bright light was behind them and they were, you know, like, and, and the funniest thing is that orchestra went quiet. And the only thing I heard was my camera, <laughs> the single clicks from my camera and the sounds of the photographers picking up their cameras and starting to walk to get that golden light again. And I'm going, what are you all doing? Like, you should, you, you know, look at these pictures. Like what I did at that moment, cause if I had just exposed for the bears, the background would have been blown out. They would have been this light brown kind of, you know, like not a lot of tonal range in there because the light was behind them. But by exposing for the background and having no light on my subjects, I was able to bring the bears into silhouette. And so using that 200 to 500, 5.6, I had my Nikon Z7 here. Um, I used a, a shallow depth of field because I didn't want a really hard horizon line and I really wanted the water droplets and the bears to pop from the background. And so I used the minimum depth of field 5.6 rethinking this I might have gone up just a little bit just to make sure you know that back leg was in focus on the bear that was jumping. Um, but I chose one eight thousandth of a second to get all those water droplets so everything from exposure to aperture to angles. It's all creative decisions that can celebrate our own unique voices. When photographing the bears at um, Brooks Falls, the thing that really struck me was the movement and the chaos, but yet the stillness of these bears that were fishing. And so I wanted to, to, to photograph that showed the stillness amongst the chaos. So I chose a shutter speed, 1 20th of a second that was fast enough to get the, the bear still, but slow enough to get 
all of the water moving to have this kind of play of shapes and and play of stillness and i waited for a while and the light hit the waterfall and i exposed for that and when the light didn't hit the bear i was able to drop the bear into silhouette so i was really excited about kind of um you know just playing with the textures and playing with the stillness and, and the chaos so the the shutter speed here was my creative decision to produce something that was a little bit different on, in a scene that a lot of people photograph the the bears of brooks falls I have traveled all over the world to photograph bears. I love bears. And this year I decided I was going to go down to South America to photograph the um, Andean bear, also known as the spectacled bear, <laughs> because sometimes the, the patterns make what look like glasses around the eye. So, um, but the Andean bear is one of kind of the lesser known bears. Um, more people pay attention to polar bears and panda bears and grizzly bears. But to me, the Andean bear is just so magnificent. It's a it's a mountain species that has its den at 14,000 feet and the mother and child mothers and cubs have such a, a great relationship. And I was really excited about photographing the Andean bears. So I went down to Bolivia to an animal sanctuary back in um, January, February. And it was interesting, though, because I wanted to know all about the bears, but I think sometimes our path has a funny way of leading us in a totally different and unexpected direction. And I always love when randomness can kind of lead my path into a new area. And so when I got down there, I'm talking about the bears and all these people are actually talking to me about honey and bees. And I'm like, yeah, but what about the bears? And then I stopped and I started listening. And I started to learn about this giant story that revolved around native bees in Bolivia. And it was really exciting for me because the story has so many different levels and it was so challenging to photograph. So I'm going to start by talking about the main person that wouldn't stop talking about bees. <laughs> this is Professor Oscar Amaya, also known as... It was funny because when I was talking to him about how I want to do a portrait of you, at first I'm thinking of those amazing photographs of um, Angelina Jolie with the bees all over her body. And, and while that really didn't fit what we were doing, I started thinking, well, whenever I see Rupa, I see all these bees around him and him just smiling. And so we ended up doing a video portrait. I'm very into doing video portraits. And that's when I just throw my camera over to slow motion video and I'll do a portrait that loops and use it for websites and things like that. But it, it kind of gives a little bit more, a little hint about the people. I love that our cameras have the option of just jumping over to video. It can add so much dimension to what we're doing. But I do want to tell you a little bit about Rupa because it's amazing. Rupa got his degree in biology in Columbia, uh, specializing in sustainable stingless beekeeping. And since 2018, Rupa has traveled all over Bolivia and Brazil teaching rural and indigenous communities how to preserve nature by using harvesting of honey to connect people um, with their environment, it, which creates a sustainable job opportunity in very vulnerable regions. And so it was this beautiful project where Rupa is going all over and he's teaching people about how to harvest the honey from native bees. I had been to this area of Medidi, which is on the edge of the Amazon in Bolivia about 12 years ago. And I remember when I went, there were like three flights a day. It was easy to get to. It was beautiful. There was so much wildlife. It's this area of incredible biodiversity because it's got altitudes um you know like mountain ranges and so it's got the low altitude uh, amazon animals and then the high altitude and it, it just has some of the most biodiversity in the planet so i was really excited to get back and when i found out that rupa was going and teaching some of the indigenous tribes that lived in the amazon in that region i was like i'm in i'm going i was so excited but then I started looking at flights and there were no flights. There were two flights a week, one on a Tuesday and one on a Thursday, and that didn't fit my schedule. So we ended up having to take a private car and we had to take a 10 to 12 hour journey down dirt roads, which included part of the death road, which is named because of how many people have died on it. And when I got to this area, I noticed that it had totally changed. The tourism was way down. I think the pandemic hit Medidi much harder than 
of many places. All these mining and logging companies have moved in to start pulling nutrients from the from the land. And they've also started contaminating the water with mercury. And a lot of these indigenous villages, they're starting to get sick and test really high for mercury when, when people test their hair, like really high levels of mercury. And their main food source has always been from the river, the fish. And so they're all of a sudden having to find more ways of, of making income so they can go to the town and buy food because they can't live off the land as much anymore. Uh, the electricity has been cut off for a lot of the villages way down downstream saying that we have to sell the electricity and also the park rangers fees have been cut so there's a big increase in animal trafficking and with all this you know, people are looking for ways to make money. And I talked to a gentleman down there in one of the communities and he was saying, I think that the government is trying to basically drown our town so that we start accepting the logging and mining companies because that's where all the money's coming from now. And then because the government's controlling the airspace as well, it like absolutely broke my heart. But through all the disasters that were happening down there, all these people were coming together to learn about the bees. And it's like they found this hope in this little tiny native bee species, hope for creating more money, hope for having honey to eat, hope for, you know, also, you know, the, the bees are protecting the, the, you know, the nature and the Amazon. Listen to Verde, which was the animal sanctuary I went down to for initially the bears. They're focusing a lot on rewilding in Bolivia. And a lot of that is through restoration of land that has been affected by fires and deforestation. And one of the ways that you can do that is protect its pollinators. These, there are 500 species of stingless native bees and 450 of them live in South America. And the, the native bee species are responsible for 70% of the um, pollination of native forest. And we were on the edge of the world's biggest native forest. So it became the story that all of a sudden I was really, really excited and passionate about. And on top of that, this honey is some of the best I've ever tasted in my life. The, the native bees, they, they separate the honey, um, the, the pollen from the different plants, the different flowers at different areas of their hives. And so the honey tastes a little different from can be sweeter on one side than the other. It is and it's also used for medicinal purposes. It's been proven to help with cataracts and and eye issues. And so it's 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 a very amazing type of honey that I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with. In the past in the region, people to get honey would go and they would squeeze honey out of hives and and without fully understanding native bees that would end up killing the whole community of bees and it would kill hundreds of them. So teaching a sustainable way is is vital to help restore these lands and help people connect with the native bee populations. So here's Rupa, here's one of the villages and Rupa, even though he speaks like three languages, probably more, but I know he speaks Spanish, Portuguese and, and English fluently. Um, a lot of the villages we were going to, they had their own dialect. And when they couldn't understand what Rupa was saying, they would take out their smartphones and just record every step so that they could um, take care of the bees and make the hives themselves. And so there were there was always a lot of phones, which I thought was really, really fascinating. But people were super curious and it was really beautiful to see that people were coming together and, and learning about bees. There are a lot of heroes in this story uh, besides, you know, I'm Rupa, Lucinda Verde, that's you know, putting this project on and people in the communities that are now working to have the bees best interest in their mind. Amazing charities like the Wellbeing Charity, which is one of the main donors for this, this project. Um, but for me as a photographer, the main thing that I needed to now photograph was the bees. <laughs> and this provides a big problem because these bees are insanely tiny and erratic and fast. Um, Rupa said this, and I think this is really important. One of the main problems in insect conservation is the inability we have to relate with insects because of their small size. With the use of technology, we can see very small details of their lives and bodies that will help us build a stronger feeling of identification and admiration for them. So I'm like, all right, I've got to figure out how to photograph bees. Now, these bees are not just any bees. They're super erratic, super fast, and they're like kind of unpredictable. And when I say tiny, these bees are tiny. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I pulled, I have a quarter that I keep in my camera bag to kind of screw on my tripod plate. And I pulled that out and I put it next to the hive and, and one of these senoritas, that's the local name for this bee, the senoritas, uh, jumped on the quarter and it looks kind of like he or she was giving me a, a hello, but um, it was a great like way to show their size. <laughs> So that produces a lot of problems because we're dealing and, and, you know, like Rupa said, people don't understand how to connect because they, they it's not like a bear. You can't see those emotions and that and those facial expressions and, you know, photograph them fishing and things like that. So the big challenge for me was how am I going to photograph bees in an interesting way that's going to show behavior and get people to care a bit more about the species. So first and foremost, I took out my Z9 and my 105 and 50 macro, and I just got photos of them hanging out at their hives, eating honey and, and doing different things. Seeing the proboscis, which is um, how they feed, move back and forth. It's got like two parts to it. It's really beautiful. And I've got all the slow motion video of, of the proboscis going. Um, but to me, I wanted an elevated shot. I wanted something a bit better. So I started thinking, well, how do I, maybe I could try photographing these bees in flight. And I started with um, photographing one of the darker species and I wanted to celebrate it as a warrior. So I, I kind of had this dark image that I wanted and I wanted some lights. I wanted the still action. I wanted the, the motion to be still in the air. So for this shot, I used the Nikon Z9, the 105 macro, and I used a shutter of one four thousandth of a second. Now with my flash, it's really cool because with the SB5000, I was able to do what's called a high speed shutter sync. So with the flash, a lot of flashes and cameras sync at about 1 200, 1 250th of a second to your, to your camera. And with 1 200th of a second or 1 250th of a second, like that's, that's not fast enough to get a bee's wings still in flight. So I had to play around with high speed sync uh, and that's something to look for in your manual talk to the people over at bnh if you're looking to do high speed sync in your flash and they can give you some advice on how to set that up with your specific flash unit and if your flash can do it with your camera but for the z9 it was um, under the custom functions the e1 and i went in there and i put it on this one over 250th of a second with auto fp and that is a uh, that syncs it to the higher frame the the higher shutter speeds and so, yeah, that's that's how I got this first shot. But then I'm thinking, you know, these bees to me, they are not like still in flight. They have so much movement to them. So I'm thinking, well, what can I do to show that movement of the bees in flight and to like bring people in a little bit to their journey? So I started playing around with rear sync for slow shutter speeds. Now this, I will say, it took tons of trial and error. It was only on my second trip to Bolivia that I fully got this down. And also like, I literally, I didn't have any Wi-Fi. I couldn't check out things when I was, you know, confused or trying to learn, but I ended up borrowing Rupa's hotspot and calling Paul Van Allen. <laughs> He's my go-to and, and he helped. And he even talked to Rupa down in South America and me and like talked about the bees and the behaviors. And, and we had this great brainstorming session. Oh, by the way, Paul Van Allen likes as hard of questions as you can give him. He's kind of loves figuring them out. So <laughs> feel free to put those questions in the chat room because he is such an amazing resource and I use him. He's on my speed dial. <laughs> But not to say that you should be on any of your speed dials, but you can use them right now in the chat room. Anyways, I called Paul Van Allen. I downloaded the whole SB5000 manual on my phone, which is something I highly recommend if you're going out in the field, because I'm not usually a manual person. I should be more of one. And as technology is getting better and better, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really should start playing and reading these more. So reading that SB5000 manual helped me out quite a bit. And Paul started teaching me, and the manual started teaching me a little bit about um <laughs> paul started teaching me about high speed um uh, about about flash duration so i'm going to talk a little bit about flash duration but here's one of the first shots that i got that i found to be successful so i had my flash set up and one of the things i had to do is i had to actually cut the power of my flash so that my flash duration went quicker and could stop the action so and we're going to talk about that i'm going to show you my whole setup to doing this so i had a homemade diffuser and one of the things is is like you know i know with 
diffusers and light. I'm not quite sure exactly what I'm looking for quite yet. So I bought a whole bunch of supplies and I made a lot of my own diffusers when I was traveling because I wanted to be able to bin the light differently, I wanted to be able to soften it more or less. So I brought all these supplies and I ended up making a whole bunch of ho homemade diffusers. But for this shot, I shot my photo at one eighth of a second. And I had that rear sink on my flash and rear sink throws a little bit of light at the very end of your exposure. So it'll let you keep your camera open for longer, but the flash will stop the action. And the thing is, is that like you would actually, I, I'll, I'll go into the, all of that in a minute, but let me show you my BTS setup. And then we're going to talk a little bit about flash duration. Just to give you an idea of just how tiny, tiny, tiny these bees are. They're little smallest probably the smallest thing I've ever worked with. I thought tadpoles were hard, but these are senoritas. We are in Bolivia. I have my flash here with a homemade diffuser. It's got gold foil on the inside. Give it a lot of bounce. I bought all this stuff with kids art and supply stuff at Michael's. I've got my trigger, my 105 macro. I've put a black sheet up behind and I am doing some rear sink for the flash of these bees in flight. I've noticed that they hover right around that spot. So that's kind of what I'm focused on, getting them hovering and shooting at one tenth of a second. So let's see how it goes. Now I'm using my flash to stop the motion in a long exposure. So the flash at a lower power actually has a better flash duration, which is the amount of time that the flash is actually illuminating the subject. So at full power, I was getting a lot of movement and nothing static. I wanted those wings to be sharper. So I moved my flash down to one eighth power. And that eighth power is throwing off a very, very fast flash of light, which is um, helping the bees look very still while in flight. Now, one thing about these videos is I keep getting silver mixed up for gold. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but a lot was going on in my head at the time and especially getting these tiny bees. So flash duration, let's talk a little bit about that. Cause at first when I had my flash at full power, I was still getting movement and it looked like a whole bunch of blurry photos. And I'm asking Paul, I'm like, you know, Hey, why, why are the flat, why, why are the images blurry? And he's like, you know, try cutting the power of your flash. And when I started looking at this flash duration, this will tell you how fast that flash goes. So I found one eighth of a second to be really good for the bees in flight because that gives me one over 5,160th of a second, which with those wings, you need something super fast. It was interesting too, because there was a challenge to me over um, bees like a lot of light. So how am I going to stop the action and use a flash when there's a ton of ambient light? So I ended up like, Listen to Verde gave me a whole bunch of black sheets and I had duct tape. So I duct taped some, some black sheets um, behind where the bees were flying in and out to their hive. And you probably saw that in those videos. Um, but I made sure I talked to the bee biologist. And one of the things about photography is I never want to impact wildlife in a negative way. So I asked, is this gonna change their behavior? Is it gonna confuse them and make sure it's darkness? And he helped me find a way to set it up so that the bees, when they were going in and out of the hive, they just saw the sunlight on the other side and they the light was still hitting the hive. So it, I was very careful to make sure I wasn't changing behavior or anything like that. But I ended up putting up this black sheet to, to, block, be, um, to block the light behind them because I needed a darker scene so that I could like, use one eighth of a second and have that be my primary light source. This took me a lot to kind of figure out. It, it, it's, but I was super excited too, because I was starting to get photos that, that showed the flight pattern and showed the path and showed the movement of the bees. And then I got a whole series of shots that had, it looked like ghosts. It looked like spirits were coming out of the bees. And, and what that was is, is, these bees are actually the guards of the hive. So they stay close to the hive and they move back and forth and they're keeping an eye out for intruders. They're keeping an eye out for bees carrying bad pollen and then they, they divert them away. So they have this back and forth movement. And it was really beautiful though, because I didn't even know about this behavior until I saw the photos and I showed them to Rupa and I'm going, what's going on here? And he's like, that's the guards doing their back and forth because since they were hanging in one spot for a longer time and then moving, it was showing that spot looking a little bit more still, which is what the ghost looks like and then moving back and forth. So all of a sudden 
my photography is teaching me and letting me connect to you know, connect deeper to these tiny insects in and in, in their behaviors. So I started thinking like, what else can I do? What else can I do to kind of understand the movement? One of the things that I love about the Z9, and I've been looking for ways to use this, and I love this feature, is that the Z9 can photograph at 120 photos per second. It's not just a video function, it's a photo function, 120 photos per second. That is a JPEG function, it only gives you JPEGs, but at the same time with having that many files, I've worked with JPEGs a lot in the past, I don't mind it being JPEGs, I think it's great to get 120 photos, and you can put those photos together and make a 6K video, which is pretty awesome. And so having those photos, so I started taking the bursts of the bees going in and out of the hives, really interested to see how they were moving. And with this, I decided to do two things. I decided to take those files, those photos, and actually create a video. And I'm going to show you a little video. It goes from real speed to slow motion to kind of extreme slow motion, more than I'm supposed to, but it's more because of the behavior that I'm excited to share with you all. And then I started playing with using those photos and stacking the photos and trying to put that on a single single image, the flight pattern of the bees. So here is the real time of the bees moving, right? You see them, and then I move it to slow motion. And when I started seeing this, we started seeing that the bees were fighting. They were throwing each other down. And we kept going through the files and Rupa's jaw just dropped because he had never seen this behavior. It was undocumented behavior on these bee species. And he was really excited because he didn't he didn't know that they had this this tendency to have this competitive side of, of getting into the hive. And so we took all those files and literally I pulled them into photo mechanic and I was scrolling and we were looking at all the behaviors and discovering things about this species through technology. I took those photos and here's what the stacks look like. It was really nice because when I loaded all the photos into Photoshop, I could turn on and off layers and and just have a certain period of time to kind of show and you know show the movement of the bees. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do that towards the end of this presentation. But all of a sudden I was seeing the patterns and the movement and how they were spiraling around and how the bees were making shapes in the airs, a uh, shape in the air. And this were all taken with the 105 macro, the Z9, using the 120 photos per second, and then using Adobe Photoshop for stacking. And then Rupa said this to me, and, and that just kind of made my world. Because to me, if I can use photography to connect people deeper with nature and to, to show behaviors, to show a biologist new behavior about a species that he's a specialist in like it just it, it made me feel so good about what i was doing with photography rupa does use my photos and my videos in his lectures he lectures all over south america he's lecturing now in australia and he's also hopefully going to start lecturing in africa soon so he's one of the leading native bee specialists and and to be able to provide him photos that he can connect other people with deeper and deeper with nature. It's just, it's it's great the power we have as photographers and, and what we can do. And with the technology getting so much better, like being able to discover movement, discover behaviors and and help other people teach with our work. It's it's I'm I'm super excited about using technology to to really connect deeper and deeper with wildlife. So it's gotten me really into pollinators. Um, I'm, I've been into pollinators ever since I did a, a web story for National Geographic a couple years ago on dragonflies and butterflies. And being down at Cinda Verde, they also are trying to help out the butterfly populations. And I was asked to photograph some chrysalises. And I got to photograph this amazing metallic chrysalis. And um, it was really, really hard because when I first, when I first started to photograph them, because of how metallic the surface was, the flash kept hitting the metallic surface and just blowing out sections. And it was really bright in my camera. And so it was one of those situations where I'm going, oh my gosh, I really got to figure out how to angle my lights in order to not get these bright white spots all over this chrysalis. I do have another BTS video that shows exactly how my setup was. I want to first mention that I was working with a group that was 
um, you know, working to create these chrysalises and release them to help pollination. So I'd never cut the chrysalis out or anything like that. Like the, the, the bee scientist was with me and she gave me the chrysalis on a stick that I was photographing and, and the chrysalis did hatch and survive and live the next day, but nothing I did impacted. And I was, so if you see a chrysalis in the wild, I don't recommend you moving it or doing anything like that, that might harm this butterfly because the pollinators are really important to us. So here is my little BTS. And I once again, mix up gold for silver. I apologize about that, but here it is. Today I'm photographing chrysalises and not just any, but super shiny reflective ones. And I am pretty proud of the setup I've come up with. Um, let me show you. I've got my think tank roller. I've got kids arts and crafts supplies. I've got my SB 5000 with gaff tape lots of kids arts and supplies crafts and supplies a couple of diffusers i've got gold the same i have here it's lined on the inside of this flash i've got the chrysalis here i've got my nikon z9 and i have my 50 macro on with my triggering my flash with this wr11 So here's the results. And I thought this was just absolutely beautiful because it's stuff that you can't really see with the naked eye. It's, it's these tiny details, these tiny metallics, the color, the patterns that come out. Um, and these images also are, are, are being used to help educate on pollination and, and the butterfly species, which I'm really excited about. So this one, this, this specific chrysalis, it looks like a stitching on a leather shoe or something. I thought it looked really, really cool when I looked at the detail up close. We're going to talk a little bit more about bigger pollinators now because I, um, you know, the big pollinators, well, you've got for the main pollinators, the bees, the butterflies, um, but also the hummingbirds and bats, but I, I don't, um, I haven't photographed bats yet, but the bigger pollinators, um, I got a call beginning of the year to work on a Nikon campaign with the new 400 millimeter um, Z lens 2.8 with the built in teleconverter. And I was asked, Hey, do you have any ideas for a campaign? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I want to photograph hummingbirds. And I want to go down to Ecuador and, and, and do a piece on, on the bird species down there because this lens has incredible versatility. It was rainy season and I actually love photographing in rainy season because you get a lot of fun behaviors. You get less tourism and that's less impactful on wildlife. Like if you ever travel to Africa or, you know, in big safari seasons, like when there's a ton of people looking at wildlife at the same time, it causes a big impact. So traveling in the less tourism seasons is actually a very environmental thing that you can do because, you know, we do want to take photos of wildlife and celebrate wildlife. So I was excited to go down in rainy season, but having a a 2.8 lens, a, a, a long lens that had this low light capability was great because hummingbirds you need those higher shutter speeds. But also this lens, if you activate the 1.4 um, teleconverter, the internal, and stack it with the 2x and then put your camera in DX mode. I'm shooting on DX mode a lot. And DX mode is a cropped mode in your camera, which crops your sensor and lets that lens go just a little bit longer. Um, you can actually shoot this lens at 1680. So it goes from a low light 400 millimeter lens to a lens that you can photograph at 1680. So I'm thinking this would be like the best birding lens ever. And I was really excited to, to use this lens and go down there and, and photograph the amazing hummingbird species with all the colors. My campaign was mainly a video campaign and I'm sure, um, you know, Paul might be able to throw in the, the link to the video campaign or something like that in the chat. But if, if not, you can look up, you know, Christy Odom uh, 400 uh, Z campaign and it, it's on Nikon's YouTube channel. Um, but I was, I was really excited to do this video campaign. But another aspect of the campaign was to take some stills. And I see so many bird shots and to be completely honest, like they're very similar. So I wanted something that really expressed my own feelings and did something a little different with bird photography. But I always start with the basics. Like let's see what it's like getting a natural light shot of the birds in flight. You know, high shutter speed, 
one over 1,250th, which isn't fast enough quite to, to get those wings sharp because you, the wings are just so fast on hummingbirds. So everything in the series was taken with the Z9 and the Nikon Z400 2.8 with the built-in teleconverter. Um, but I, I definitely changed around a lot of things to, to get different styles of photos. And the first thing I wanted to play with was, let's see what happens when I add a flash. And once again, I wanted that high spink, uh, the high shutter speed spink, of the high sinking shutter speed, um, so that I could capture those, those wings in flight. So I shot this one at one 3,200th of a second using that high speed shutter um, sink with the SB5000. I like keeping my flash a little bit off camera. So I had my flash at about a 45 degree from the feeder and these birds were coming up and down in the feeder and having the flash, I all of a sudden started seeing more details like the raindrop on my head. And I started seeing more in the texture, getting just a, a, a little more information on the hummingbirds. I will admit that I did forget diffusers. And uh, once again, I tried to make my own diffusers. <laughs> You don't want to do direct flight, uh, direct flash. Um, so I ended up using COVID masks and I made one that was like straight up and down. I had all different COVID mask diffusers that I made out there, but they ended up working really well. I used to be a wedding photographer and I remember at weddings, people would sometimes use napkins or, you know, like find ways to create diffusers if they needed them and they were out and they didn't have the proper diffuser. But it's really easy to kind of like think out of the box and try to figure out like, all right, the light needs to be softer. What can I use to do that? And, you know, doubling up masks or, you know, like positioning them to go straight up and down. There's tons of ways to kind of um, work on the fly. So I also wanted to do a little more of this rear curtain sink um, because I wanted to show the movement in the wings. I wanted the stillness and the details, but the movement in the wings. So I wanted to be able to move to the slow shutter speed, um, but have my flash stop the action. I will say that I practiced in my house. I bought a whole bunch of flowers and I put my camera on rear sync. So the flash would go off at the very end of the exposure. And I moved my camera around and kind of played with, you know, uh, the movement that I saw in flowers. Cause to me, flowers aren't still, they grow, they open. And I wanted to incorporate that movement in the color. So shooting at like one third of a second and like, twisting my camera around in the middle of the exposure with a rear sink on the flash. It was a way to practice because hummingbirds are fast. You don't have a lot of time to kind of like figure it out when you're out there. So it's really important if you want to play with any of these techniques to practice in your home, even if you get photos that you'll never show anybody, like it's just good to be able to understand your camera functions and, and, you know, like reach out to the people at BNH or reach out to other photographers if, if you have any problems. So using that rear sink, I started to get um, the stillness of the birds and then movement in the wings. But to me, it was like the wings were kind of disappearing a little too much. It wasn't enough light on the wings. It was not there quite yet. So I started to think, well, what can I do to pop those wings? I was since I was doing a video campaign, I did a ton of research on light. Once again, I called Paul Van Allen <laughs> and I wanted a static light to use for video. And because I shoot a lot of high speed video, I shoot a lot at 120 frames per second. I needed a light that I could have in the field that had um, a, it, it, you don't get that refresh rate. You don't get that um, uh, glitching like the um, flashing in your light. So I needed to have a, a, a static light that I would not have any disturbance for shooting at, at high speeds. And I did a ton of research and I found um, the Astera Pixel Brick, which is, I think B&H is like the only camera store I found that actually sells it. Um, so I was really excited. They were battery power, like you plug them in, you charge them up and they're little units. And so I started to, and I use that mainly for video but it was the only second light I had out there. So I started throwing that light as a backlight because I saw something really mysterious about these birds, really almost magical. The way they sound over your shoulder, the, all the plethora of colors, like I wanted to bring that all out. And that pixel brick, you can adjust how bright it is, how dim it is. You can adjust the color temperature. You can make it bright red. And it, it was a great little, I've, I've got two of them now. I think they're fantastic. Um, so I put that as a backlight and I put it really light and all of a sudden it was picking up 
the color of the wings and it was picking up a little more gold in them. So I was really excited to use that in combination with that front flash that was on rear sync. And, um, you know, I was able to go down to like 1 20th of a second, which showed more movement in the wings. But through using that, I was also able to separate the rain droplets a little bit with this little rim backlighting. And I could see the rain droplets bouncing off the heads of the hummingbirds. And every once in a while, when I hit the flash, the SB5000 correct in the foreground, it would it would bring out this almost metallic feel. And in this shot, I particularly like, even though it is out of focus, I, I still like a lot of my mistakes. And I, I love that you see this heart, you see this bright metallic green, you see the gold wings. And, and this was something that definitely expressed how I was feeling with the hummingbirds. Started looking at that backlight and going, wow, what happens if I just turn off the front light and just use that static backlight? And I started really playing and, and having a lot of fun with kind of more abstracts. I love having fun with abstracts. And this was one of my favorite shots from the shoot. Um, I know it's all a little soft around the edges, but if you look close, it's it's got this real fine feather detail in that um, right above the wing. And the, the slow shutter speed using one, what did I use on this? One one hundredth of a second for a hummingbird. That's a really slow shutter speed. Um, it, it kind of made this moon shape the way the wings went. It was this full circle. And I was really excited to kind of see the details and just kind of play around without knowing what I was going to get. One thing I have to mention is before I did this campaign and before I do any shoots, I do as much research as I can because I never want to compromise or impact wildlife in order to get a, a good photo. And so it's really important that we um, we are all stewards for wildlife and, and we don't do anything negative. So I did go on to the Audubon Guide of Ethical Bird Photography and I researched a lot about using flash. I also talked to people that work with hummingbirds. I talked to people in local Audubon chapters and asked them all about what to look for to make sure I wasn't doing anything negative. And what I learned about hummingbirds, it's actually okay to photograph hummingbirds from feeders, but feeders have to be treated very specifically. And there's a whole guide on the Audubon website about how feeders need to be cleaned. I think they have to be cleaned daily and and to make sure they're not transmitting diseases. And, and also like, you don't wanna, um, so I ended up calling every single resort I was gonna be staying at. And I asked them how often they clean their feeders, if they have the birds well being, and, and first and foremost on their mind. And I did a lot of research to make sure I wasn't impacting anything negatively. Uh, one of the things I will say, I it like, makes me so angry when I go on my Instagram and I see people that do rear sync shots of owls and I'm like, oh, you can't do that because flash, it really hurts nocturnal animals eyesight. And so, you know, like I would never pull a flash out for a moth or anything like that because of what it does to their vision and it could really hurt their ability to hunt and hurt their ability to, to do the basic things they need to live. So I always go onto this Audubon guide and, and reread it. They've got an amazing guide on their website. Also, the International League of Conservation Photographers has a guide to ethical photography that applies to more wildlife. And it's something that I recommend each and every one of you do because I never want, especially if I teach you something and you use a technique, if you use it negatively to impact wildlife, it's just going to hurt my heart. So <laughs> I want to make sure everybody does things to, to be stewards for our environment. With the hummingbirds, one of the things that I was really drawn to was the fact that their wings and their body moved around so much, but their head was so still. So I wanted to play around with that. And I decided to go to this, this burst of shooting off the 120 photos per second with the Z9. And then I pulled those images into Photoshop and I played with different blend modes and different stack modes and also different like, you know, inverting of light and things like that. Cause I wanted to, to see the movement in the wings versus the the stillness of the face and i was actually really excited to kind of see this it, it to me was expressing what i was feeling out there which is this chaos and movement all over but the stillness of the face in the middle of it so i'm constantly thinking like well what am i you know when you're a kid and how kids ask questions and they're like you know oh wow how do the wings move so fast and the body stays so still it's those sorts of questions that if you can find a way to incorporate that into your photography and try to find a way to match the technology to to bring that deeper understanding and to celebrate the behaviors you can bring more people and to connect more and more with wildlife right when i moved over to mirrorless i started getting really excited about multiple exposures <laughs> we're going to talk briefly about multiple exposures 
Uh, I love that the mirrorless cameras have the this ghosting where you see your first exposure and then you can line up your second exposure. And so with the multiple exposures, um, a lot of times like I'll be out and I'll photograph a bird and the bird will stay in the same position for ages. And you're like, well, what else can I do? It's just staying there. And so here in this situation, I what I saw were these amazing shapes. So I put my camera on multiple exposure mode with two exposures. I took one shot and then I rotated my camera upside down and took another shot. And it brought out this great, I lined it up using the ghosting and it brought out this great negative space. Um, so this is something that I love playing with when I'm out in nature. Um, this is the Z9's multiple exposure modes. You get this option that says multiple exposure mode. You wanna turn that on obviously. Uh, but it's got two on options. One's just regular on and one's on with two arrows and that's on continuous and that keeps your camera on multiple exposure mode until you turn it off. So you'll just keep shooting those multiple exposures over and over. If you just have on, it'll do one set of multiple exposures and then kick back into regular shooting mode. The number of shots is literally the number of frames that you take that the camera's gonna overlay on top of each other. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the overlay modes um, with the next slide, but I also wanna talk about like, you always wanna put that save individual pictures in raw on because like you'll be doing a multiple exposure of an eagle and, and in the middle of the multiple exposure the eagle will catch the fish and it'll be this epic shot and if you don't have that on it'll only give you your multiple exposure if you have that on on this setting where you've taken two shots and then you're getting a multiple exposure you'll get three files you'll get the original raw the first file the original raw the second file and then you'll get the multiple exposure so it's it's really nice to keep that on because sometimes i find that in my multiple exposures i actually just want one of the frames um, but here's what the overlay modes are um, and for the nikons it's add average lighten and darken and i think canon has different terminology for that um, i think it might just be light and dark or something i don't know but it's something very similar um, so add takes your exposures, it adds them together, and it doesn't modify at all. For like 95% of my multiple exposures, I use the average setting, and that will take all your multiple exposures, and it'll average the exposure out for you, and, and your multiple exposure will have the proper exposure settings, or it might have, it probably will if you're properly exposed. Um, the light mode takes the lightest pixels from each of the exposures. So if you've got a black cat with a dark, with a light background, white, the lightest part of that frame is that light background and then you've got clover so it looks and it says the background of the white cat is lighter than the background of the clover so we're going to take that and comparing the black cat to the clovers the clovers are lighter than the black cat so the final multiple exposure comes out with the silhouette with the clovers inside the silhouette of the black cat okay now when this mode came out i saw so many photographers doing like bodies with trees it was like all over um, when people started getting really excited about multiple exposure, but that's the mode that they were using to do that. Darken mode takes the darkest of pixels. So you get a black cat and clovers um, between the two frames. The clovers are darker than the white background and the black cat's darker than the, the clovers. So your final output is the clovers with the black cat. And you can even see the clovers through the whites of the eyes because the clovers were darker than the whites of the eyes. So when I'm out seeing crazy shapes like giraffes necks, I'm often like, I want to play with the chaos of the shape and play with multiple exposure and overlay those shapes. I love when shapes repeat or when there's zebra stripes, I'm like, I want to see what happens when the stripes go together. So I put this, put my camera on multiple exposure mode average with four exposures and I rotated my camera 90 degrees between each of the exposures. And I'm like, what would happen if I mixed up eight, eight exposures of the, the zebras and just played with the chaos of lines? <laughs> so it's a lot of fun to just kind of play with if you're looking for something to, yeah, uh, celebrate shapes and textures and add overlays. So sometimes I'll take a flower and just do a multiple exposure of the stems over top or just play with the textures. And I know that whenever I'm doing multiple exposures, I feel like a kid. Like, so I end up with shots that look like a, you know, remind me of my childhood days, like a pinwheel. I saw this, um, this butterfly on feeding and I ended up taking um, my camera multiple exposure mode average with four exposures and I rotated my camera 90 degrees between each exposure. And with the ghosting, I was able to like line it up perfectly, but it was something that was really playful and really, you know kind of express what i was feeling when i was shooting this multiple exposure so here are some really dodgy pictures i took at home to practice <laughs> just because it's important to do that um so this is i just took my dog in the trees outside and on darkened mode um, you can see that the trees are darker than the white background in the second image and the silhouette's darker than the the trees so that's what darkened mode did light mode took the lightest again the white and then the trees are lighter than the silhouette 
So I want to talk a little bit about how I've used that in different ways now, because this light and darken mode I found in other areas, and I'm really excited about that. I was doing this shoot at the Southern Plains Land Trust, which is an amazing area in Colorado, um, staffed by amazing people that are working to rewild Colorado. They have um, bison. They're looking to reintroduce bison. They got black-footed ferrets the other day, um, and black-footed ferrets are critically, critically endangered, and, and they're one of the people that are working to reintroduce the species. And so they now have um, 30 black-footed ferrets, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. And on my drive down to photograph at Southern Plains, I ended up in a horrible storm, <laughs> a horrible storm. But I had all my camera gear, right? And I'm like, all right, so I, I ended up at a gas station for hours. It was it was really quite frightening. But I when the storm passed, I ended up setting up my camera and I ended up setting up my camera um, to take photos at different intervals. I used interval timer mode on my camera. I didn't use time lapse, but it's I was it was getting my camera to fire at different intervals and to give me a series of photos of this lightning crashing. I did make it into a time lapse and post and, and here's the time lapse. So here's the settings I used. I went into interval timer shooting on my Z9. Um, I usually, and for lightning, it's really good to kind of put your camera out and do these interval, um, do photos at different intervals because lightning is just so hard or you can get like those, those remotes that, that go off when you see the lightning. But um, I don't, I didn't have one of those on me. Uh, I put my camera out and I just let it take a photo every three seconds. And, you know, I let it take almost a thousand images. and. For me though, when I was seeing the lightning, I wasn't trying to get a time lapse. I was really curious about the lightning bolts. I was curious about if they struck the same place, if they originated from the same place in the cloud. I was really curious about like the patterns that they would make in the clouds. So I took all those files and I put them into Photoshop and I stacked them. And sure enough, the lightning does look like it went towards a central spot. To me, the shot looks a bit like a brain. It was like this lightning was all over in the clouds and kind of coming together at the bottom. And and when I saw the lightning, like this is what I wanted to produce. I wanted to produce something that taught me and connected me with how the lightning strikes and the repetitive patterns. So I literally went in and selected all of the files that had lightning in them, and I stacked them in Photoshop. And I'm going to show you because this is really, really cool. So, I mean, I can do a full class on like every single one of these techniques, like rear sync and, and um, you know, stacking images. But today I'm just introducing different techniques that there are ways to, to, to learn more about each of these techniques. I have over 12 hours of education online on Adobe Live. And so if you look up my name in Adobe, it'll, it, I've got four hours on time lapses. I've got classes on, on, on slow motion video. And if you're looking to, to read more into it, look up my classes on, on Adobe Live. Um, but real quick, I'm gonna show you just a couple of basic things in Photoshop I used to do this image. So you take all those images and you go into your Photoshop and you go to file scripts, load file into stack, right? So file scripts, load file into stack. You get this little pop up and you go to browse and you select all the files you want. You know, I've selected some files here with a lightning bolt. The attempt to align source images, if you had wind or if things are moving around, that'll align that for you. I had a tripod, everything was quite stable there. I didn't have to use that. Um, I didn't want to create a smart object. I just wanted to load these layers um, into, into, into Photoshop. So here are all the layers they are loaded, right? And so how Photoshop works is it, you know, normally it'll show you your top layer. So you think of it as a stack of photos going up and down, and those are your layers. And so if you select all of those in your layer panel, as you'll see, I've selected all of the, all of the layers there. Um, if you look above that, there's the word normal that word is your blend mode and normal it's just going to show you that top layer but if you select that you will see there's all these different ways of blending the images and check this out there's a lighten mode and there's a darken mode just like lighten and darken and multiple exposure it does the same thing light mode takes the lightest of pixels darken mode takes the darkest of pixels so that's all i had to do to to kind of pull that lightning out I had to pull one layer to get the stars to be static because the stars were moving as well and I didn't want that in my final image. Um, but that gets a little bit more complex. Well, I was really excited about the final product here. 
Photographing the planet is much bigger than the bears, the lightning, the non-human primates. You really don't have to far to get those wow moments in nature. You know, the ones that make your jaw drop. Being curious, celebrating what you love. The camera isn't just a tool, but it's a creative device to celebrate us. My first story for National Geographic, the one I did online for them, was literally on dragonflies and butterflies. And it was 30 miles from my house. You really don't have to go far to, to photograph and to, to marvel. And a lot of times it is the tiny things that, that people need more understanding of. And as technology is getting better and better, we can bring people in and teach them about the lesser known species. This little tadpole has a massive story, and this was one of the hardest shoots of my life, getting this photo of the tadpole, a story that I'm super excited to share when I'm on stage at Optic West in just eight days, I think it is, seven, eight days, coming up very, very soon in Monterey, California. Uh, this was a journey that I, I, I'm so excited to finally be on that stage after it was canceled because it was supposed to be March 2020. So I'm really excited that it's finally happening, and I can't wait to, to share more stories of of how I, I I got crazy shots like this this tadpole was hard <laughs> but it was once I saw it though the photo with the cheeks and like some of the images you can see the heart and it's just like to see so much detail and it just it connected me so much to this amazing species that is dying unfortunately um, but I'm really excited to share that story and I really hope that you all go out there and, and use your camera to celebrate and to connect and discover and find out ways to marvel even at the nature that is possibly in, in your local pond or at your bird feeder or, you know, if it's caught in a storm as you're driving. If you want to follow more on my journey, uh, you can't make it to Optic West, please follow me on Instagram. You've spent the last hour listening to me talk about my work and my passions. I would love to hear about your passions and see your work. I get really excited when people share with me like, hey, I took this shot that I love of, you know, the bird at my feeder. And, and so feel free to to follow me, all you have to do is put your smartphone up and scan that QR code. It'll take you straight to my Instagram page. And and I'd love to see your work. I, I, I love to hear people's stories and, and see what people are passionate about. If you want to hear more about the workshops that I do and the overseas trips or um, you know, join my mailing list, uh, my website, once again, you can just scan that QR code. It'll take you straight there. At the bottom, you see it says join the mailing list. You put your email in there. I send out probably four emails a year, not many at all, because I don't want to bother anyone. But anybody that wants to talk about their passions and learn more about photography and experience the world together, I'd love to have you. I want to thank you all. Time is so precious. And the fact that you all gave me your time today is just such a beautiful gift. Big thank you to Nikon, to David Brommer, B&H, all the amazing people fighting every day to protect this planet, protect its nature. Photography is a constant reminder to me of how grateful I am of wildlife and the wild spaces. My camera is taking me on this world of discovery and ultimately given me this deeper connection to this amazing planet. It has made my life better. Hopefully through our photos, we can all share our passions. Maybe even today, I made one of you love a bee a little bit more. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Christy. That was that was amazing. That's some incredible work. Wow. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, you know, you had me loving the bees when they became <laughs> stingless. Stingless was the operative word. Was oh my goodness. Yeah. Right. Like they're so cool. <laughs> they're just amazing. I think what's really incredible, though, the way you you were able to photograph behaviors that haven't been seen yet using technology and art. <laughs> exactly. So, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, really well done. So I got a couple of uh, questions for you. Yes. Um, first off, everyone, uh, the YouTube chat lit up. Everybody loves <laughs> you and your work and uh, you really resonated with so many people. So that's amazing. Thank you very much. I um, want to start off with uh, uh, BLZ Blizz says, geez, how close are you to the bear? And this was in the first set of photographs. <laughs> we were close. We were with um, a lot of bear experts and we had a guide with us at all times that really understood the bears and made sure that we were all safe. So we were, um, we did a lot of float trips down a river. So a lot of times the bears would be at the edge of the river and, and they, they, they would be pretty close, but they, we were never in danger. They had 
tons of salmon and they weren't threatened by us at all. It's an area where people fish quite a bit. So they're used to having people around. And I think it would be a little scarier being a fisherman, taking the fish out of the <laughs> river around the bears. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I think bears have, yeah. Bears in different areas, like there's a, a lot of bears that, you know, if, if they're in desperation for resources or losing their natural habitat or, you know, you, you hear stories of bears with violence, but bears out in the wild for the most part, or, you know. And you're doing polar bears next year. Yeah, we're trying to. It looks like we're going to have our inaugural polar bear trip, um, hopefully in 2023. We're just getting the details together. Um, so that's one of the next, hopefully. And if any of you are interested in, in being on that list when that trip opens, just um, shout me an email and I'll put you on that list. That's amazing. Okay, um, Cynthia Herrick asked, she, well, she says, great presentation, Christy, which seems to be a, a resounding theme. Uh, okay. So Cynthia Herrick asked, what is your frame rate for slowing down the action? My, uh, for video, I, I shoot most of my video 120 frames per second, and then I slow it down to 30 frames per second. So I get 25% of, of, of normal speed. So it goes down to 25% of the time. <laughs> okay, Jan uh, Peterson's asking, uh, do you... Uh, often or ever use a polarizing filter even with the z400 tc lens and wildlife photography oh i need to use more filters <laughs> no the 400 was a little more challenging because it's got a drop-in filter and so that being a lens that was um new to the market i didn't use a polarizer too much but i'm excited to um I think that there's a lot more I could do with, um, I photographed a whole bunch of turret ducks and, and whitewater. And so it was something that, um, I think that there could have been some improvement if I had had one. Um, but I, 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 I kick myself all the time. I'm always like, I need to use my tripod more. I need to use more filters. So, um, yeah, bravo to people that are mastering those things. <laughs> all good. All good. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is a, uh, this is a question from Jeff and Mass. Jeff and Mass said, and I, I like this question quite a bit. I saw on BH YouTube another photographer who swears by, by auto ISO. What do you think about that? And just do you just do you use the auto ISO? And if you do, what are the ISO parameters that you tend to go for? Or do you just lock in an ISO that you like? That's a great question. And auto, if I was to have an automatic function on my camera that I would use, it would be auto ISO because I think aperture and shutter are such creative decisions to get a, a different aesthetic. Um, and ISO is, is become so good at high ISOs that it's the thing that I mainly change around. But um, I've been photographing for so long that I, I um, do everything manual. So I set the ISO I'm looking for and I, I, I don't do auto anything for my exposure. Do you ever feel that you miss a shot because you had a like in quick changing lighting situation to get the shot and you're in manual and you just kind of can't switch it up quick enough or you never miss a shot and you're just totally on it <laughs> not often no I, I i'm i'm especially with the mirrorless cameras like i i can see what my exposure looks like and you know before i click the button i will say that i've started started missing shots a little bit more if i go from a mirrorless back to my dslr um because i'm used to getting that instant like this is what your image is going to look like mm -hmm. and with the dslr you don't get that so sometimes i'll click and then it'll be off because I've been shooting mirrorless so much. So I'm shooting mirrorless pretty much 95% of the time. So the second I, I miss shots now with the DSLR, which is really kind of, I'm always like, ah, how did I do that? I used to never miss shots with my DSLR, but um, because I'm so manual with all of my settings. So occasionally like um, on my DSLRs, I'll, I'll put those on auto ISO if I'm you know trying to do things quick because of the fact that mm -hmm. it, you know I'm thinking more in a mirrorless world now. I love it in mirrorless cameras when you hit exposure compensation and you see what's happening. It's exactly. Like, as <laughs> it's opposed to, yeah, I'm seeing it afterwards. Okay. Uh, Garrison E. Penna says, outstanding portfolio, Christy. Again, another, uh, another common. Uh, <laughs> what is the one animal that you dream of to hope and see in photograph that you haven't already photographed? Polar bears. Okay. <laughs> I also have tigers on my list. Um, but you know, and it's funny though, because the, the Indian bear led me to the bees. So I'm really excited about some of the, 
undiscovered in the small and you know like the the tadpole thing i can't wait to talk about tadpoles like i know that sounds silly and it, it isn't the image that i i you know obviously chose to advertise because people would be like what but it's it's really exciting to be able to like you know and i'll be talking about sharks on the big stage too so don't don't worry it's not all about tadpoles <laughs> Great, great. I will be talking about bigger things, but um, you, you know, see the, at this dichotomy with you, I think really big mammals or really small insects or <laughs> or small animals. Do you photograph anything in the middle? Uh, you know, I, pikas are tiny. I love pikas, and I, I love pikas. Okay, I've got a question for Paul Van Allen. Paul, um, okay, there he is, Mike Latecki. This yeah. is a, this is a great question. Any idea when the Z400 4.5 will be in stock in the United States? <laughs> we're, we're shipping very limited quantities now, not nearly enough, as b &H will tell you. They want more. So, yeah, this, we're, we're, we're making as fast as we can. Um, I want them to be to catch up so I can stop getting the question from David Brommer. So, <laughs> so you know, but pro pro tip for everyone out there: when when something's really hot, new, and it's back ordered, you know, put your order in at B and H Photo, and we'll ship it when we get it. And if you do find it somewhere else and you can't live without it, you can always cancel your order and just buy it somewhere else. So that's the best bet. But really, uh, it's a descending order for people that place orders. So just get it in, and you know the photo gods will be good to yeah. you, and they'll arrive. Uh, here we go. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, uh, Paul. But, but stay on. We like seeing your face. Uh, this is a good one. I've never right. used a flash before. Oh, black and white. That's the Tri-X filter. I've never used a flash before. Can you recommend one to use with my D500? Paul, will you take this one? Oh, oh, electronic flash. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, a D500, I'd look at either the SB700 or the SB5000, depending on what you want to do. And how you want to do it, uh, the experts at BNH will help you though. Uh, and I know a lot of the guys on the phones at BNH, and, and a lot of the guys in the store at BNH. So, you, so they walk in them. if you're local or give them a call. You, yeah, I trained. I trained, you trained them. them all. I trained a lot of them. <laughs> you did. So, so yeah, I, I mean, it really depends what you want to do. But the uh, the five thousand is the biggest one. It replaces the 800, 900 series. Um, very powerful little flash. Uh, the seven hundred is a little bit more um, price friendly. So, but those are the two flashes I'd look at for my SP5 or for my D500. Okay, sounds good. Uh, and then uh, from Italia Boitner uh, says, with the large lens being discussed, how close would you have to be to the subject in order to use the flash? Oh, with those B subjects or just in general? I mean, I guess, yeah, I was pretty, you saw how close the flash was to the bees. It was like right underneath in the video. So I, and the hummingbirds was a little further away because they were flying a little bit further away, but those, the, the SB 5000 is quite powerful. So I didn't have to be like, you know, right up in the subject. It was nice to be. A I, I, I get, Christy, uh, did you have the SB 5000 on the camera? No. I, these, or did you have? I never shoot with it on the camera. Okay. So, so, so you put the SB 5000 six feet from the bees, you'd be 30 feet back with a lens and still make it all work. Hmm. I guess it's a, we could have a discussion about guide number <laughs> and how all that works. But with TTL flash, it, it's you don't have to. A lot of that is done for Point you. And but, shoot. Yeah. TTL. Yeah. But, and if you needed further distance, you could just up the ISO as well. So it's sure. a, yeah, it's it's very it's very versatile. Okay. Again, you had so many compliments. Uh, Juliette Mansour says, "Amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Very valuable hour for me." So. <laughs> We love Great. that. <laughs> All right. So uh, everyone, this uh, presentation was recorded, so you can go back and find information that you wanted to. And if you missed it, it's going to be up uh, pretty much moving forward permanently now. So this presentation is now officially Optic West archived. And uh, of course, you won't be able to ask Q&A when, when you watch the video. But uh, maybe if you have a good question, you could always email Christy or better yet, come to Optic West in a week and uh, I will be there in person. So thank you so much. And don't forget, there's also Nikon Z6 Mark II is going to be given away during Christie's presentation on Monday, November 7th. 
Thank you, everybody. I want to wish everyone a happy Halloween. And I'll see you all next Tuesday for the last webinar in our Optic West pre-show webinar series. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you very much, Nikon. Thank you all. Dave, I'll see you uh, this weekend or next weekend. Next weekend, indeed. Okay, I'm going to have a next Nikon weekend. SP, by the way. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going film. Oh. To the, you see, you see, I, 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 you, you may not leave with it because I might find it in my bag someplace. No, wow. I've seen your SP on, on, we have, on a social. It's awesome. We did, yeah, thank you. We, we did hire security for, for Optic West. So thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Cheers.